uh, beginning of the year, first Sunday of the year, actually, January, um, I got ordained. Some of you are here. Oh, yeah. Woohoo! <laughs> and some things have been changing for me since I've been ordained. It's getting weird. Um, I feel like I'm compelled to use my family more often in sermon illustrations. Glenn. Um, I feel like I need to make points that all start with the same letter of the alphabet, maybe a three-point sermon, things like that. I've never, ever opened a, a sermon with a joke. Oh. I'm going to do that today. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. I'm not good at telling jokes, but this is an oldie. It's really old. I think my dad, who was also a pastor, might have told this joke as well. So it just it comes by naturally. What can I say? So if you know the ending, I, you behave yourself. <laughs> Once I saw a guy who was about to uh, jump off a bridge. I said, don't do it. He said, nobody loves me. I said, God loves you. Do you believe in God? He said, yes. I said, are you a Christian or a Jew? He said, a Christian? I said, me too. Protestant or Catholic? He said, Protestant. I said, me too. What denomination? He said, Baptist. I said, me too. Baptist Northern or Baptist Southern? He said, Northern Baptist. And I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist. And I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region or Northern Conservative Baptist Eastern Region? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region. And I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879 or Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. And he said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. And I said, die, heretic. And I pushed him off. <laughs> Thanks for laughing. <laughs> okay. That's absurd. That's absurd. We all get that right. But it's funny because it's, it's true. I mean, we wouldn't push someone over a bridge about it, but aren't we prone to see the world in terms of us and them until we find out one thing from basic preferences like coffee or tea, medium rare or well done. We all know what's right on that one, I hope iPhone or Android to more serious issues, next slide, that speak to a person's values, angels or Dodgers. <laughs> Where are my Dodger people? Come on. We're going to take over the church. Joe's out today, so it's Dodgers. Okay, never mind. <laughs> we can have fun and we can enjoy the differences, but what we find, don't we, is that we really do prefer to align ourselves with people who have the same affinities. And has there ever been more a divisive time in our world than the current climate of cancel culture where anyone who doesn't perfectly align with the dominant narrative is, is shamed and, and scorned, even fired, and has their life ruined. Great men and women who've accomplished significant change for the good in our time are having their monuments torn down because their past behavior is being weighed against today's declared standards and found wanting. And those who are judging today will, in a few years, be on the outs because standards will have again shifted and what was once fine will be horrific and offensive. In this nation of freedom and abundance, we have the luxury of choice. And so we choose to separate and align based on a checklist of preferences, not unlike a Starbucks mug where you check off what you like in your coffee. And our, our circle of friends, it just gets smaller and smaller as we weed out more and more people who don't quite hold exact the same views as we do. And it hits close to home. And there's no one in the hearing of my voice today who hasn't been touched by the divisiveness because it's not just whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, a liberal or a conservative, a Christian or not exactly the same kind of Christian. We now divide on whether or not you wear a mask or not, whether you get a vaccine or not. And my point isn't to chide anyone for deciding either way on any issue, but to suggest that in all the noise, as we sift out who we will keep in our circle, we're being cleverly distracted from the only division that matters, and it's actually a life and death issue. 
Dividing on affinities keeps us focused on one another as us and them and across an aisle. When we are in grave danger of missing the point, it's not affinity that matters, it's identity. And our focus shouldn't be across an aisle judging one another, but above to the only judge that matters, amen? And we've been studying through Ephesians, focusing on the foundations of the church. And for the past three weeks, Pastor Joe has wonderfully brought us through some of the most significant passages in all of Scripture, focusing on worship and prayer and God's grace. And I encourage you, if you haven't already, listen to those messages. I did all the way through to make sure there was no heresy before I got up and preached today. And, I, you know, correct a few of those things. Don't fire me, Joe. Um, this morning, we're going to begin where Pastor Joe left off. So go ahead and get your Bibles and open them up to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to pick up after three of the most well-loved, greatest of the good news verses in the entire Bible. Chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. And I bet many of you have memorized these at some point in your life. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's an amen right there. It's this good news and these great truths and they follow some pretty bad news that Paul already said that namely that you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And it's hard to think of ourselves as dead unless we've been up late putting together Christmas presents for the kids. We generally feel pretty alive. But Paul has made a big point that while we might look alive, we're actually dead. But here's great news. And it hinges on two of the best words in the entire Bible. But God. You were dead in your transgressions and sins, but God. Amen. God, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And that is the best news. And we love this truth. And we get it. And we love those verses. But look, Here's where the good news gets even better, if that's possible. Here's where we see the depths of it all, how it shifts our focus from our tendency to, to keep focusing on our preferences and our affinities and move us as it should to understanding and living according to our identity. Chapter 2, verse 11, the very first word. Next slide. Therefore. Therefore. Now, here's a good pastory thing to say. Whenever we see this transition, that word, there's a great question that we need to ask before moving along. What's the therefore, therefore? Yeah. It points us back to what we've just learned. So based on everything I've just said is what that word means. And what has Paul been teaching? Well, bad news and good news. Bad news, we are dead men walking, destined to receive the full brunt of God's wrath. Good news, but God. That's where the therefore, and that's why it's therefore. And with that in mind, then we move forward to today's passage, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Therefore, remember that you, formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision that is performed on the body by human hands. And Paul points out this great distinction, a significant separation. What's our tendency? Well, we like to divide on political lines racial lines, gender lines, even denominational, religious. But Paul reminds us that there is only one distinction that matters. All other distinctions are in the flesh, like skin color, hair color, physical features. But this distinction, circumcision, made by human hands, but a sign from God, and it's a real distinction because circumcision separated God's people, the Jews, from everyone else, the Gentiles. He says, remember you Gentiles, it's not that you were just dead, it's that you, and then he piles on more of the bad news, the bad news that began in chapter 2, verse 1. He gets even more bad news. He, I think he's desiring to really wake us all up. Verse 12, he says that you were at that time without the Messiah or, or separate from Christ alienated or excluded from the citizenship of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Pile it on Paul, right? 
what's the most serious sin you can think of? You know, the one that you're the most convicted of actually having done or the one that you can't imagine hopefully ever doing? Cheating on your spouse? Stealing? Lying? Drunk driving? Harming someone out of anger? Think to the Ten Commandments and breaking any one of those, right? But what made the top three? They're all about a relationship with God. Number one, no gods before him. Number two, don't make any images from other gods. And number three, don't treat his name lightly. Don't, don't take the name of God in vain. God, 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 and forth more God set aside time, the Sabbath, to worship him. And yet, I don't think we really appreciate the seriousness of our state before the but God moment from back in Ephesians 2, 4. I mean, <laughs> we tend to think of ourselves as not too bad. I mean, if we're honest, we're not too bad. I'm, I mean, after all, it's not like I'm Hitler. <laughs> I'm not Jeffrey Dahmer, right? Look that one up, kids. Don't, no, don't, don't. <laughs> if you look up Hitler, actually, some of you might need to do that, too. Um, but we, we, what do we do? We pick, like, the most heinous people of all of history. I'm not like I'm that guy, right? Yeah, we've done bad things. Who hasn't? I mean, I'm not an axe murderer. And we feel pretty good about ourselves. And on top of all that, we show up to church. Good job, you guys. And we sit with the rest of the not-so-bad folks. And we're thankful that we're on God's side and we're going to win in the end. Isn't that what matters? <laughs> when surveyed, 90% of the people who were asked, do you consider yourself a good person? Guess what they replied with? Yes, I do. And they qualified it with this statement. I'm not the best and I'm not the worst. <laughs> I mean, most people consider themselves morally and ethically adequate. <laughs> most people think, I'm no saint, but I'm not a horrible human being. And they have so-and-so in their mind, right? And they can point to someone, usually Mother Teresa comes up, who is obviously better than them. Or they come to Hitler, who is obviously worse than they are. But listen, when we think like that, We've turned the issue back into what we are comfortable with. We have come back to our default position about what comes naturally to us. It's back to us and them thinking. Us, the pretty good guys, the others, anyone who eats their steaks well done, and Hitler. Right? <laughs> it's not us and them. Listen, it's us and him. God, and we are all on the wrong side, no matter how nice, ethical, or moral we are. Mother Teresa is on this side, right next to Hitler, right next to me. There's no hierarchy of good, better, best people, or vile, viler, more vile people. We're all in one big, historically hopeless heap of humanity, separated, excluded, with no hope, without God, without Christ. <laughs> and now let's go home <laughs> on that note. <laughs> look, look, this is, think of it this way. This is like the worst sandwich ever, sandwiched between no Christ and no God is being outside the only kingdom that matters, having no covenant protecting you, completely hopeless. Next slide, worst sandwich ever. Listen, think with me back to Genesis. We're going to hop through history for a minute, and I uh, hope all the ladies in the women's Bible study are like, yay, I'm going to know the answers. You will. It's going to be cool. I want you to see this because the significance of being without Christ began back here in Genesis 3 when God tells Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply because there would be a seed, an offspring from them who would come to crush their enemy. So God commands them to sit tight and wait. Nope. <laughs> Good answer, Kathy. She's paying attention. No, he doesn't tell them to sit tight and wait. He tells them to be fruitful and multiply so they will bear his image throughout the world. God blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply. And they didn't do that. And from their own rejecting of God to their murderous son forward, the world is corrupted by sin. Fast forward, God calls out a man, Noah, to preserve his name in the world. And after washing away corrupted humanity, he gives Noah a blessing and some instructions. Then God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And again, instead, what happens? Fast forward, Genesis 11. Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be 
doing the exact thing God totally commanded us to do, scattered across the face of the entire earth. And so they gather together, and they start singing, we are the world, and they... And they don't spread out. <laughs> Instead, they hunker down together and decide to build a tower, thinking they'll make a name for themselves and make a way for God to come down to them. And ironically, God does come down. But he breaks up that party at this tower, and he sends them off babbling with distinct languages. Instead of commanding them to be fruitful and multiply and expecting them to bear his name, he disinherits them. He disinherits those nations. And he homes in on one man. After this, God calls this one man from an area of what is now Iraq, and he makes a covenant with him, Abraham, a covenant recorded in Genesis 12. You can hop back there to Genesis 12, 1 through 3 if you want to, or you can just listen. I'll read this. Go out from your country, he says, your relatives, your father's household, to a land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great. You will exemplify divine blessing. I will bless those who bless you. But the one who treats you lightly, I must curse so that all the families of the earth may receive blessing through you. He says, I'm going to give you a land, a name, and make you a blessing. You're going to be a great nation, and all the people of all time will be blessed through you. And God commits to Abraham and gives him this promise. And in chapter 15 of Genesis, he notarizes that covenant. Anyone ever been to a notary before or needed to get a document notarized? Anyone ever been through mortgage paperwork? Anyone still trying to finish it all? <laughs> Stacks of things to sign? So today, if you make a contract and you and the person are contracting with, you sign this agreement, a bunch of post-it notes and arrows, and you get it notarized, right? In biblical times, they had contracts too. They didn't have post-it notes and signage papers. Instead, they had a covenant ceremony. Super cool. You're going to be really glad in just a second we don't do it like this anymore. But they would take an animal and they would kill it, and they would cut it in half, and then they would separate the parts, and then you and whoever you were making an agreement with would walk through the bloody center of that animal. You'd pass through the parts as if to say, may this happen to me, broken open and bloody, if I don't keep my end of the bargain. But here's the twist, where normally both parties figure eight between the dead animal and bloody animal parts. God makes this covenant with Abraham, and God walks alone. He puts Abraham into a nap, like a Sunday after church nap, like the one where you wake up, you're like, what week is it? Rip Van Winkle <laughs> nap. He puts him to sleep and God passes through it on his own as if to say, listen, this goes back to Ephesians chapter two. Listen, he says, as if to say, hey, in my grace, through your faith and not your works at all, I will save you and I will fulfill this covenant. You don't have to do anything with keeping your end up so you won't have any room to boast. You lay there looking dead. Remember, Abraham's asleep. And God himself, God alone ratifies that covenant through blood. And the covenant is sealed. And Abraham awakens to a done deal. God makes this covenant. And then in, in chapter 17 of Genesis, he gives him an outward sign. And again, you're thankful we don't do covenants like this anymore. He gives him an outward sign that shows the inward covenant is true between him and God. And that sign is circumcision. Why then, pointing out our distinction, does Paul bring us back to that covenant? Because that's what he's doing when he brings up the circumcised and the uncircumcised. Those Gentiles who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision. He's bringing us back to that point in history. We should go there, and we are, to understand this better because there's only two groups in mind, and it's not the good and the bad. It's the circumcised and the uncircumcised because every other distinction is false. We're all one people. We're all one human race, distinct in creation as the only ones created to bear his image and suitable to bear his name. Male, female, slave, free, red, yellow, black, white, all of these divide on man-made ideas, but the distinction between Jew and Gentile is a real distinction, and God made the distinction, and it's based on a covenant. It's not based on race. How can we be sure of that? Think about it, because Abraham, the first Jew, had to become one. He was no different than the rest of his family he was called out from as far as being from the same tribe and ethnicity. God didn't call on Abraham and tell him he was going to change him at the DNA level. 
so that he and his descendants would be a different race. Think about it. God calls Abraham and makes a distinct nation, not a new race, and then he certifies that covenant of that nation in blood. He makes the sign of that circumcision, and he creates a new group that will bear his name and provide the only true hope, nation, name, and hope. That's what God has always been about. And now Paul brings us to that point that at one time it was ins and outs, circumcised in, uncircumcised out. He wants us to remember there has been a distinction, not in ethnicity, not in sex and geography or tribe, but Jew, circumcised, Gentile, uncircumcised. And any Gentile reading this letter would have known about this because there was still a huge monument to this distinction, the Jewish temple, right? The people of the promise, Abraham's descendants, the Jews had this place, and that's a big point that Paul is getting us to. Now, pause a minute. I don't want to lose you in the weeds here. We're going to go back in history and talk about buildings and stuff. So hang in there and focus. I got visuals and everything. I should have brought a bobblehead up here to help. But pay pay attention. I want you to really get this. Back to the temple. It's really important. The temple where the circumcised Jew came together still kept distinctions. There were separate courts for men and women. And it separated Jewish men from Jewish priests. And it also separated the highest priest from God himself. Also, there was a court around the temple that separated Jew and Gentile. You know, archaeologists have uncovered two ancient warning signs that were actually placed outside this temple. Here's a picture of it, and you'll see it carved in in Greek there. Let me read it to you. I I would love it if I could totally rattle this off in Greek. That'd be super cool. (laughs) Uh, Maybe Joe will do that for us next time. Here's what it says uh, in English. No foreigner is to go beyond the balustrade and the plaza of the temple zone where whoever is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his death, which will follow. (laughs) It's so dramatic. I really love the Greeks on that one. That was really cool. Even if a Gentile wanted to get right with God and converted to Judaism and got circumcised, they had a separate courtyard. And keep this in mind. How long has it been since Jesus stood and commanded his disciples to take the good news and go to the whole world? Well, to the date of the writing of Ephesians, it's been about 30 years. And they did go, sort of. They waited in Jerusalem like Jesus had commanded them. They received the Holy Spirit, and they began teaching the good news to people. And who did they know? Who were the first people they knew? Well, people that were a lot like them, other Jews. And under the loom of that temple and those traditions, they didn't really get a move on until Christ got a hold of Paul, who was at that time a key Jewish leader running around having Christians killed. But God meets him, blinds him, gives him a very specific mission. Next slide. Stop killing my people, (laughs) Christians. Start telling the Gentiles now about the good news. And you can read about this in Acts chapter 9. Then in the very next chapter, we read about Peter, Acts chapter 10. Next slide. He has a dream about bacon and scallops and a bunch of other formerly unkosher foods getting on the menu. But it's really a message telling him that the Gentiles need to hear the gospel. And no sooner does he wake up from his nap. Notice the nap motif there. There's a couple of men bringing a message from the most famous God-fearing Gentile that lived in that time. His name was Cornelius, and he wanted to know the good news. God had already prepared his heart. So Peter preaches to Cornelius, his entire family, and they all receive the Holy Spirit. You see, Paul is not just bringing up circumcision to point out the divide between Jews and Gentiles. He's making a bigger point about this great separation. If we don't realize that that separation was there, we're not going to appreciate it, the fact that it's gone. Because we walked into this church this morning pretty much assuming that we're good. I mean, you're in church. You're not out robbing banks today. Good job. And we have that sensibility about us. But how is it gone? How is that separation gone? All the bad news about being separated, alienated, strangers, hopeless, without God, would remain true. But Christ. But Christ. Verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who used to be far away have been brought near By the blood of Christ. You see, the most vile, violent, unjust, horrific event in all of history wasn't a bloody war. It wasn't a mass murder. It wasn't a crime against humanity. It was the bloody death of one man, Jesus Christ, on the cross. And what did his death bring? Listen, 
It brought the exact opposite of what death usually brings. What does death bring? Every one of you, your lives have been touched by death this year. Human death, it brings anguish and sorrow and loss and pain, maybe regret, maybe even a desire to retaliate if it was unjust and and maybe even to make war. But what did the death of Christ bring? Next verse, peace. He is our peace. Pause here. See, Paul is tapping into everyone's awareness of a very current event. The times were anything but peaceful. Making the point that Christ is our peace would have gotten their attention. Remember, Paul is likely writing this letter from prison He was thrown in jail because of some fake news that had circulated about him on a missionary trip when he went through Jerusalem. He was there with Jesus' brother James, and he had taken some Gentiles who had just become Christians into the temple courtyard. And some Jews saw this, and they accused Paul of taking these men beyond the court of the Gentiles. And that whole account is recorded in Acts 21. The Jews stir up a mob, screaming the fake news that, next slide, he, Paul, has brought Greeks into the inner court of the temple, made his place ritually unclean, for they had seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city with him previously. They assumed Paul had brought him there into the inner temple courts. Remember, the temple, what was it? It was wall upon wall separating everyone into their groups from one another, Jew from Gentile, men from women, and they ended up beating Paul nearly to death. The situation gets really violent, and one of the Roman leaders has to step in. Next slide. When the argument becomes so great, the commanding officer feared that they would tear Paul to pieces. He ordered the detachment to go down, take him away, Uh, by force, and bring him back into the barracks. Now, with this hostile and divisive and anything but peaceful experience fresh on their minds and everyone else's minds, Paul says, we're all separated, but Christ is our peace. He's the one who, next slide, makes both groups into one, destroying the middle wall of partition, the hostility. Not just the outer court for the Gentiles, so the Gentiles can mingle with the Jews. Not just the court separating the women and the men. There's no barrier anymore from the outer to the innermost area of that temple. It's been broken open, even to the veil that separated the most holy place that was literally ripped by God from top to bottom. And when did this happen? Verse 15. When he nullified in his flesh the law of commandments and decrees, he did this to create in himself one new man out of two, thus making peace. And to reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by which the hostility has been killed. And he came and he preached peace to those who were far off, the Gentiles, and and peace to those who were near, the Jews. Be on the alert. When you read a passage that has the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all together in one, and here it is, verse 18, so that through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. All this, it removes the affinities and brings us to our true identity. If we are in Christ, we, verse 19, are no longer foreigners and non-citizens or strangers, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. You know, a foreigner, what's a foreigner? Someone from another country may not may speak a different language. They might have different customs, clothing. They might have their passport, maybe a visa to stay for a certain amount of time. But a non-citizen. And let me do like Joe here and ask. The New Testament is originally written in what language? Hey, good job. <laughs> Joe's going to be really proud of you guys when it comes back. That's awesome. Anyway, the Greek word translated here, and I'm using the New English translation, the Greek word non-citizen, your Bible might read strangers or aliens, but the word is peroikoi, peroikoi. This is the only time this word appears in the Bible. It's an adjective, and it describes someone living in temporary housing close beside others. It identifies someone who's not a citizen. They have limited rights to be where they are. It, well, it's Joe, actually, or, or it was. On February 25th, 2020, Joe went from peroikoi, non-citizen, to sympolitai, fellow citizen of the United States of America. Here's a photo of that moment. Aw, Joe. (laughs) Whoa, whoa. America and a monkey. (laughs) Here's a better photo. I like this one. Next slide. (laughs) 
Yeah, I surprised Joe, showed up at LA Convention Center. Next slide. President Trump actually delivered that message, and, he s and this line when Trump spoke um, stood out to me. He said, as citizens of the United States of America, you enjoy full rights. You enjoy full rights. A non-citizen is at best a guest, and, and worse, basically a squatter. Someone else built the house. You don't have any business staying there, but a citizen, like President Trump said, you enjoy full rights. That's Paul's point also. Without Christ, we are people of no nation. And as proud as we are to be an American, we can all sing that song, and they sang it right here in this, in this moment, actually. We are people with no nation. Our affinity isn't to being citizens of the United States of America and getting all patriotic about that, although that's nice and well and good. We've got to get our focus off of that. We are people with no name. And as much hope and love and joy and pride you might have in your family history and your name, that's nothing. You have no hope outside of being a citizen of the only kingdom that matters. In a hostile, anything but peaceful land outside the covenant and outside the place where peace could be made, Christ, but Christ, broke all that down. No more hostility. We're written into the covenant that was signed in blood of Jesus and sealed by the Holy Spirit. There is no distinction between us and them anymore. He's broken down the wall that divides, crushed the temporary shelter that wasn't doing us any good anyway, and he made peace. Paul wrote it another way to another church group in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Next slide. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, neither male nor female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus, and that's great news, but keep reading. If you belong to Christ and you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to a promise, let me ask you, think, think, an heir, an heir. There's only three ways someone can become an heir. Heir, H-E-I-R, it's hard to say. Now I've said it too many times, it sounds weird. <laughs> Through blood, you can become an heir. Through marriage or by being adopted into a family. And listen, in Christ, he made all three happen. Through his blood on the cross, we're adopted into the family of Abraham, and we as the church are the bride of Christ. What? Wow, that's incredible, amen? And that's right where Paul goes next. This new unity needs a place to fellowship. So we have a new temple, verse 20, because you have been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are also being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And again, here's the Father and the Son and the Spirit in one passage along with and you and me, along with all the apostles and the prophets who came before us together. Listen, this is great. Paul describes this new temple the old one, remember, it had partitions separating people by tribe and nation and sex. Men here, women there, Jews here, Gentiles there. The, the temple was destroyed, though, literally demolished in A.D. 70, and not a single stone exists anymore. But do you know what stone does still exist? The cornerstone, Jesus Christ. That is the cornerstone. That is the foundation. The apostles and prophets are the foundation. The whole structure grows Think about it. What kind of a building have you actually seen that grows on its own? Buildings don't do that. But there, this is no earthly building he's talking about. It's a living, holy, sacred, spiritual place, and we're not in it. We are it. You and I are that building. If, this is really important, listen. If you are in Christ, together in Jesus Christ, we're joined we are each a dwelling where the Spirit of God lives. That's a big if, listen, because there's people in this room today who have not been put under the hope and the promise of that covenant because you're just in the building and you don't have the Spirit in you. And this is a good place to be, and it's nice, but this isn't a country club, and it's not a do-good society. This is a place for the people of the covenant not to be in, but to be the temple of God. And some of you are here today and you have never moved past that if because you're just part of a fun group of people and we are, we're really fun. <laughs> but that is delightful until it sends you to hell. 
You have to move beyond that. You have to own that and thank God. Truly, thank God in Jesus Christ that he did what he did for you, and you can't just sit there and be somehow by proxy in this group. It doesn't work that way. Together in Jesus Christ, we're joined. We're each a dwelling where the Spirit of God dwells, lives. And we're assembled here today, and it better not be because of our affinities, because we're going to get ticked off with one another eventually. You like what kind of coffee? Milk chocolate? What? Dodgers, angels, that's all deadness. Our politics, our skin color, our preferences, there's nothing but death at the end of all that. We were brought here based on the headship of Jesus Christ. We've got to let go of the things that divide us from one another. And because he broke down the walls that divide, we are truly united and we have life. Let's go back to that bridge, the bridge, the joke about the men, the things they say, and they only have all these things in common until that one thing that breaks the relationship. That's the world's way. Connection until you get canceled. Friendship until. Unity until. You only have access to peace. You have the unity. You have the hope. Not because you've been good. Not because you're in church. No, listen. If you are in Christ, here's what's true about you. You're brought near to God. You're defined by peace. You're reconciled to God. You have access to the Spirit through the Father. You're fellow citizens and saints and members of God's household. You're a dwelling place for God in the Spirit. This all happens because Christ went to the cross. In a moment, we're going to remember that. You'll be able to go back and take communion. You're going to say, God, I remember you. I remember your sacrifice, the blood that you shed for me, the body that you broke for me. Because of that moment, I'm no longer an outsider. Because of that moment, we have true unity. And listen, don't miss this. Again, don't walk out of this room today if you have not said yes to Jesus. You may have said yes to this church. You may have said yes to these people. You may have been founding an affinity of nice, good, lovely people. You're going to go to hell on that basis. That's the reality. You need Jesus. You need to say yes to him. He's the only one that can resolve the disunity that's truly in your heart because you are separated from God right now if you have not taken the name of Jesus Christ. I implore you today to make that your decision. And listen, the rest of you in this room who have said yes, we need to live that out in that true unity, remembering it's about him. And let go of the things that we really do love to hold on to. We do love our politics. We do love our American citizenship. We do love our coffee and our whatever. It's all the things. We have to make it about Jesus Christ or else this room just becomes a country club of nice, good people who gather together once a week every now and then. We've got to make it about Jesus Christ and his blood. And so we're going we're gonna to worship together. And during this time, you can go to the communion table in the back whenever you're ready. Take the cup. Take the bread. Remember what Christ has done for you and accept that and thank him again for it or receive it for him for the very first time. I'm going to be up front if you need prayer or if you need to say yes to Jesus this morning and, and do that. Make this the day that you realize, oh, yeah, I've been treating this like it's a us and them and I'm in the club. Until you say yes to him, you're not. And that's all that matters. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you so much for your blood that was shed for us. We thank you. We have the spirit. We have your grace. There's no more hostility. And forgive us when we forget that there ever was. Forgive us when we just kind of move on and we forget there was a division. And help us today to be united, united in the name of Jesus. And make that the big thing. Letting everything else go. When we come to you, submit to you, we thank you and we praise you and we continue to worship in your name. Amen.